Making our big focus this hour, August 5th marks a crucial day for Jammu and Kashmir. It was on this day in 2019 that the Jammu and Kashmir uh, moved past Article 370 and reintegrated itself with India. Since then, stone pelting has gone down. There have been investments in JNK. The Union Territory has witnessed a record rise in voter turnouts in the recently held elections and has also hosted global events like G20 in Srinagar. Tonight, as we mark this occasion, we have with us Dr. Jitain Singh to help put things into perspective. Union Minister, Dr. Jitain Singh is live with us today. Dr. Jitain Singh, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. What, according to you, has been the single most fundamental change that's improved the lives of people in Jammu and Kashmir post-abrogation of 370, sir? No, I think it's been at multiple levels, uh, at three or four levels primarily. There has been a huge transformation as far as the the realization of the democratic uh, rights is concerned, rather I would say the, the, the democratization of the entire system which had not taken place in Jammu and Kashmir but had happened in the rest of the country and Jammu and Kashmir had to wait for, 30, for 60, 70 years till Prime Minister Modi took over. And many of the provisions of the constitution which were applicable in the rest of the country, which were of public welfare, were not uh, implemented in Jammu and Kashmir even though there was uh, no reason to do so because it, uh, they neither reflected the identity of the region nor the, uh, nor the separate uh, uh, existence of uh, the region. Uh, right, like for example, you have a very simple provision like 73rd and 74th Amendment of the Panchayat Act which was brought in by none other than the Congress government headed by the then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. And even though Congress was a part of the government uh, for decades together, in Jammu and Kashmir, it, uh, in its uh, fitness, decided not to implement this because uh, then the central grants would go over straight away to the elected representatives of the local bodies. So they didn't possibly prefer that happening. Similarly, uh, you have another uh, telltale example of uh, the Article 370 having been misused or, uh, if I would say, hesitantly abused by the then ruling parties in order to continue their existence in power generation after generation. For example, in 1975 during our agency, Mrs. Gandhi extended the term of the state assemblies and the Lok Sabha from five years to six years. The then National Conference government in Jammu and Kashmir was quick to adopt that legislation. But three years later, when the Muraji government reversed the same uh, amendment of the constitution and brought it back to five years. The rest of the state assemblies went back to the five-year term, but Jammu Kashmir continued to have it till it was 5th or 6th of August and the Article 370 had been done away with. So there was a democratization of the territory on the same lines as the rest of the country. B, development, which had suffered uh, not only in terms of the number of uh, important projects having been delayed and stalled, but also on account of the regional discrimination, which was a very often a grievance coming uh, from uh, both the regions, more so from the Jammu region. Third, the governance part. Many of the good governance practices were not applicable. Like, for example, Prime Minister Modi introduced, uh, announced from the ramparts of Red Fort that he uh, was in favor of the interviews being done away with in selection to the government jobs. And uh, the Department of Personal Training, the DOPT, issued orders uh, doing so from the 1st of January 2016 itself. But in Jammu and Kashmir, this order was made applicable only after the abrogation of Article 370 because that left a room for the powers that be to accommodate their candidates of their own choice for whatever reasons. And this, in the process, they also invited uh, uh, accusations of corruption, accusations of uh, uh, discrimination, accusations of nepotism. So I think, and, and last but not the least, which is not very often talked about is that there is a change in mindset happening, which of course takes time, takes one or two generations. Because for 70 long years, the mindset of an average uh, citizen of Jammu and Kashmir, more so the youth got conditioned to the so-called special status. So when he, when he came out of the territory and tried to mix with his peers in the rest of the country, he thought of himself as somebody different. The others also looked up to him as, as a different kind of a being. So that feeling of belonging as a citizen of India, as much as any other citizen of India, possibly was not happening. So that mainstreaming, not only on the ground, but mainstreaming of the also mindset has happened. Yes. Now, is income from agriculture, tourism and employment improving 
in Jammu and Kashmir. Have you seen that change over the last couple of years, Dr. Singh? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you asked that because, uh, you see, uh, the startup movement started in India in a big way after Prime Minister Modi uh, gave a call in his Independence Day address, start up India, stand up India. But somehow it did not catch up in the same way uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. Again, it has happened only in the last five, six years. And I think it's also mo very significant from the point of view that uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir and like several other Himalayan states or UTs has an exclusive domain of agriculture. The aroma uh, assets and the aroma mission has actually been initiated from Jammu and Kashmir has given rise to what has been popularly described as the purple revolution about which Prime Minister Modi spoke in Man Ki Baat and which had a W displayed even in the 26th January parade at the Karthavipad. So Jammu and Kashmir is now being credited for having given India a new genre of startups, namely the agri startups, and also try to clear off the bus, the mist, explore the myth that startup does not confine only to the ITs or also does not confine only to very big science degree holders. So that's another. And I'm sure that also gives me the confidence to say that a huge amount of value addition is going to be done to India's economy, India's future growth story uh, by states and UTs like Jammu and Kashmir, which have remained unexplored both in the terms of uh, natural resources as well as the human yes. resources. The human resources, because as I said, because of being left out for reasons of Article 370, etc., the and the discrimination being taking place at the behest of the then ruling parties, the human resource somehow got dormant, particularly the youth, because when the youth got conditioned to uh, understand generation after generation that look here, there are only a privileged few who would be entitled to get the government jobs, would be entitled to get admissions to higher education. The common youth virtually gave up and thought that this was not possibly a place where he could be offered any opportunity or look for opportunities and also started moving out of uh, the territory. Yes. So that kind of rekindling of the aspiration has happened because if you see natural course, the youth of Jammu and Kashmir is highly aspirational. And the aspiration was there, but it had got dormant. So there's a rekindling of that youth aspiration as well. Okay. How do you feel, you know, when you see people celebrating New Year's now at Lal Chow, going to the cinema as well in Srinagar and also hosting parties? No, I think this is, this is a fitting lesson. In fact, uh, I'm glad you asked this there because uh, I had said this even before the abrogation happened, that the common man walking in the streets of Srinagar wants to come out of this nightmare because he has been witness to three generations getting sacrificed at the altar of this misguided terrorism, also sponsored from across the border. And there was a vested interest which wanted this state of unrest, terrorism, militancy, violence and bloodshed to continue because it enabled them to get elected with just about 10% vote share. And I, in fact, said once in Parliament that could be one day a uh, suggestion to have a minimum threshold of vote share in order to get recognized as a member of parliament. But nevertheless, it suited them. And therefore, what happened was that the common man lost his voice or his voice got drowned behind a wheel of fear. And a hartal call would be made from Islamabad, Pakistan. The shops would be shut in Srinagar. And you saw immediately after the changeover, those who had predicted or for, tried to forewarn that there will be bloodshed, there will be nobody carrying a tricolor in Srinagar, are now witness to the scene where you have tricolor flying over every government building and people also voluntarily holding it aloft. So I think what was happening in the last 20-30 years, particularly during the, during the militancy phase and also prior to that, was an anomaly. And I said so in the parliament. Uh, during the debate, during the abrogation debate, I said this was a miscarriage of history, this was a miscarriage of justice, this was a miscarriage of democracy, and possibly it was God's decree that we had to wait 70 years for someone like Prime Minister Modi to take over and redeem this and get rid of, and, and, and enable us to get rid of this predicament. Yes. Now, we've seen a spate of terror incidents, though, uh, in, in the past few weeks in Jammu and Kashmir, what do we do with people still collaborating?
with terrorists there in that region, sir? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm, 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 like you, or like any right-thinking citizen, we would always uh, not only be opposed to, but also pained at the thought that somebody from amongst us, from the citizenry, is trying to collaborate. But having said that, let me also tell you that the pattern which was being followed by the militancy and terrorism over the last 30 years is no longer there. And that ecosystem has also been burst to a great extent because Prime Minister Modi initiated a decisive approach to curb terrorism. And the zero tolerance policy for terrorism actually was translated on the ground. So not only the collaborators, but also their sponsors. And you would recall, these are the same, uh, same gentlemen who used to be chief guests at the Pakistan embassy, etc. in New Delhi. Now they are lodging in Tihar jail, etc. So the message has also been a deterrent for those who would dare do this or indulge this for whatever reason, for the monetary reason, pecuniary reason. And therefore the militancy will no, no longer be allowed to thrive as an industry. But having said that, I understand when you ask this question, you have in mind some of the terror incidents which have recently happened yeah. in the Jammu region. And I think strategically speaking, it has also been so because the terrorists have been under tremendous pressure in Kashmir Valley. They are mm -hmm. virtually on the run. And to make news here and there, they try to hit out at the soft targets. The attention or the focus has been sought to be shifted by them towards the Jammu region. And accordingly, the forces both the army as well as the paramilitary forces have also uh, redone their strategy, which of course cannot be discussed publicly, but it has been effectively redone. The village defense groups have been revived, revived in a much bigger way with modern weapons and modern training. And I'm sure this is the last phase of militancy or terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which is actually coming to an end. And this is just the militants on the, on the run. And in the Jammu region, I think another advantage compared to Kashmir region is that the local sport is not that easily forthcoming. So from that point of view, I am very optimistic. I think in the times to come, Jammu and Kashmir is going to vibrate with a, as an industrial hub, <coughs> as we have seen uh, investments coming in both in Srinagar as well as the Jammu region, even in the border district of Kathua. Okay. So, and a whole lot of education institutions opening up there. So it's going to be on a progressive path as a part of the mainstream journey led by Prime Minister Modi. All right. And now you yourself have, of course, won an election from there uh, in the recently concluded Lok Sabha uh, polls. Uh, how do you assess the electoral mandate right now of Jammu and Kashmir? No, I would not make a forecast or sort of, you know, indulge in um, 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 doing that of thing, like, you know, as is, as, is uh, uh, as happens often very fashionably before the elections, you start, um, uh, everybody becomes a pundit, election pundit. Uh, without indulging in that, I think what is the greatest matter of satisfaction for me is that the Bharatiya Janata Party has started gaining acceptance more and more in Jammu and Kashmir. Even in those areas which were hitherto uh, considered to be out of bounds for BJP or where the Bharatiya Janata Party was seen as a taboo and that too because Congress and its allies had spread all kinds of lies about the BJP like they had, they had earlier done in North East which was also sought to be undone after 2014. That if BJP comes, they'll do this, they'll do that, they'll interfere with your eating habits, they'll interfere with your prayer habits, etc., etc. But now, particularly with, the, with a different kind of uh, work style and a work culture introduced by Prime Minister Modi, yes. they have come to realize that, look here, this is a dispensation which believes in justice to all, yeah. which believes in appeasement to none, which reaches out to those who need them. We have a whole lot of uh, schemes, welfare schemes to cite an example. For example, the PM Avas Yojana where a Pakka Makan is converted into a Kacha Makan, uh, sorry, Kacha Makan is converted into a Pakka Makan. And you will see a whole lot of colonies which might have never voted for BJP or which had different kind of views have uh, now uh, been converted into Pakka houses. So yes. that has led to a change of mind, which of course takes time. As okay. I said, it takes a generation or so. Uh, to get out of that mind that has been conditioned over more than half a century. Now, what progress, though, is being made on uh, restoration of statehood and conduct of assembly polls? Because there are many who would want to see that as soon as possible in Jammu and Kashmir. 
No, I think as far as uh, that issue is concerned, I don't have to say anything after what has been reiterated more than once by the Honourable Prime Minister as well as Home Minister on the floor of the House. He said elections would happen in due course of time. He also said that the statehood would be restored. And this has been said by the Home Minister, said by the Prime Minister. So I don't think I need to add okay. to what has been said by the two senior most leaders of the government. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.